Hey, this morning, I'm going to share with you out of Matthew 14, what will be a very familiar text to many of you in this room. But I'm going to encourage you and, and challenge you this morning to allow the Spirit of God to take a familiar text, yet drop new truth and new revelation in your hearts. I think one of the crimes that we commit as it pertains to the reading of scripture is that once we read a story, a chapter, or a book, we scratch it off our list and act as if the spirit of God, who is the spirit of truth, who leads us into all truth, no longer has permission to tell us fresh things out of an old word. I don't know about you, but you can read the same story in the same Bible for a thousand times, and the thousand and first time, God by his spirit will show you something Something so new that it transforms everything about you. That's why I love the word of God. It is the only living, breathing text that exists. It doesn't change, but it changes us. And so I'm going to share with you a familiar story, but then believe that by God's spirit, he's dropping new truth into your heart. So he who has ears, let him hear. In Matthew 14 and starting in verse 22, the gospel author Matthew tells us a story on the backdrop of one of Christ's great miracles, the feeding of the 5,000. And where we begin today in our reading of scripture is the verse immediately following that miracle. And in verse 22 of Matthew 14, the Bible says this, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. And at the same time, Jesus dismissed the crowds. I want you to see this today, friend. There is a danger that you must be aware of as this church continues to grow. If you're not intentional, you run the risk of being in the crowd without actually being connected to the king. Here's the reality. It's easier to hide in a big church than it is in a small one. In a big church, you can blend in. In a big church, you can hide out. In a big church, it's easy to appear as if you are connected when really you're just part of the crowd. And if we were to be honest, sometimes we think of church like an automatic car wash. I'm going to shift into neutral. I'm going to take my hands off the wheel. And by the time I'm done, I better be all cleaned up for the week ahead. No, friend. Church is an invitation to invest your time, your talent, and your treasure in the house of God so that you will be transformed by the presence of God and in doing so, develop disciplines, patterns, and habits that drive your lifelong pursuit of the things of God. If we was honest, some of us want the pastor to cook the food, chew the food, spit the food in our mouths, digest the food on our behalf, and then start the whole thing all over again the following Sunday. No, this is an environment where you can grow. This is an environment where you can be challenged, be offended, get over it, forgive, love, be stretched, and develop friendships. See, it's my job to lead you to the well, but it's your job to drink. And you got to fight the urge to develop a crowd mindset. You are not a number. You are a name. You have a story. You have something of value to give. And you have something valuable to receive. And you are not just a consumer. You are a living stone in the house of an almighty God. And you know why the crowds are there? Because the free food is flowing. Jesus just fed 5,000 a free lunch with 12 baskets of food left over. But as quickly as the crowd gathers, they also disperse. Here would be a great question for 2023. Who is in your life because of the free food versus who is in your life because of you? Watch who still stands with you when the free food runs out because those are the people you need in your boat. Some people are only part of the crowd until they disagree. 
the only part of the crowd until the food stops being free. See, what tests your resilience is not the good times, it's the bad. Anyone can have a great marriage when you're on your honeymoon. But what about when the bills are tight, the kids are acting up, and the romance seems to fade? I'll never forget this. I was doing a funeral a few years ago for a man who had passed away in our church. Now, after the service, there was a time of food and fellowship in the foyer, and I was doing what I normally do. I'm making my rounds. I'm shaking hands. I'm hearing people's stories. I'm learning their names. And I saw an older gentleman sitting at a table by himself, enjoying the plate of food in, in front of him. So I decided to strike up a conversation. Hey, what's your name? Where did you come from? How did you know the family? What was your relationship with the deceased? He said, oh, I didn't know the man at all. I was just walking by and saw that you guys had free food. <laughs> Here's the problem. We got an entire generation of people who are fans of Jesus, but they're not followers. They love the free food, but they can't stand the idea of considering the cost. They're not here for a long time. They're here for a good time. They're not interested in what they can give, only what they can get. See, in the church, our need for entertainment is high and our desire for deep formation is low. Therefore, as soon as the free food runs out, so do we. But I want you to notice what is happening here. Jesus is forming his disciples by giving them a separate and distinct identity apart from the crowd. See, Jesus could do more with 12 than he could with 5,000. Why? Because it is not the size of the crowd but instead the depth of their commitment that ultimately determines to which degree God can use a person for his glory. Do you know why I ask you to tithe? Do you know why I ask you to serve? Do you know why I ask you to pray? Do you know why I ask you to attend or invite a friend or a family member? I am doing my best with God's help to help crucify the crowd mentality so we can resurrect a discipleship identity. We are here to be deeply formed by Christ's presence and deep Deep formation is impossible without equally deep roots. See, my roots have to go deeper than the shallow soil of offense. My roots have to go deeper than the shallow soil of preference or inconvenience. My roots have to go deeper than the hurt pain, frustration, or misunderstanding. I got deep roots because I'm interested in deep development and that doesn't happen if I give up when the free food disappears. When I give, when I serve, when I attend, when I pray for someone else, when I invite, I am transitioning from a watcher of the ministry to a worker of the ministry. I am going from an observer of the kingdom to a participator in the kingdom. I am changing from a receiving mindset to a giving mindset. Do you know that at Christmas time, my joy does not come from getting yet another pair of socks under the Christmas tree? My joy comes from seeing my kids open their presents. It's not that I don't like to receive gifts myself. It's that a hallmark of spiritual maturity is when you find yourself being overjoyed at someone else's blessing without asking the question, why not me? Maybe, maybe. Just maybe if you celebrated when someone else got blessed, God could trust you with a blessing of your own. Do you know why the crowd doesn't have buy-in? Because it doesn't cost you anything to be part of the crowd. The crowd costs you nothing. Being a critic costs you nothing. But being a disciple that will cost you everything. And in the final estimation of things, it'll be the best investment that you have ever made. See, disciples of Jesus are different. Now, they won't easily give up on their faith. 
They don't easily give up on their commitments, their community, their church. Why? Because it costs them something to be here, so they're not going to abandon their investment. I'll never forget buying my first car. It was a 1989 gold Dodge Aries. If you've never heard of this car before, there's a reason for it. It was ugly. It had problem after problem. It went zero to 60 sometimes, and that was about it. But when I paid 1200 for that, because it cost me something, it instantly became valuable. And can I tell you, maybe the greatest threat that we face to Christendom in the West is a costless faith that has produced a powerless people. I bought this car. It was a rattle trap. That thing made so many noises driving down the road. God is my witness. I'll never forgot when I was driving on the freeway one day and smoke started to come out of the steering wheel. <laughs> this car had a demon. But you know what was so funny? The second that I was forced to pay for it, all of a sudden, I had rules that helped protect its value. Yeah, we're going to go through the drive through but we ain't going to eat in the car. Yeah, you better wipe your feet off before you get in. This is a classic. They don't make it in this color anymore. What happened? As soon as I had skin in the game, that which was common became sacred. As soon as there was an investment attached to my decision, it became and was held in a place of value and a place of honor. The problem with consumerism is that we get so used to everybody doing everything else for us that we reduce the Christian faith to a transactional spiritual relationship. And if we don't find him valuable, and if we don't find him beautiful, and if we don't find him worthwhile, we will never count the cost for what it means to be his disciple. That's why I value the church, because it cost Jesus everything. And in return, I owe him my life. I would plead with you today, friend, be deeply formed by this book. Be deeply formed by this Jesus. Be deeply formed by his presence. Be deeply committed to his bride, the local church. And in doing so, go from being a fan to instead a deeply formed follower. And I can promise you this, you won't ever regret it. Verse 23, and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land. It was beaten by the waves and the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. <laughs> I don't know about you, but every time I read this story in Matthew 14, something happens in my heart. Because I am reminded of when I was dead in my sin, when I was lost in my trespasses, when I was walking through the dark night of the soul, when I felt like giving up, when I felt like death swirled around me at every turn in the corner, I lifted up my eyes to the hills for whence my help comes from. And I saw a man named Jesus walking on the water and declaring peace be still. And you need to know today that the one who is worshiped by angels and elders, the firstborn of all creation, the second Adam, the author, the finisher, the alpha, the omega, that God still walks on the wildest waves that you've ever seen because ain't nothing can separate you from his love. That's the God that you serve. It's not just a story. It's a revelation of his character. While I was lost, 
while I was desperate, while I was destitute, while I was in wayward living, while I was a prodigal, God sent Jesus and he bought me and he sought me with his redeeming blood. And that is why I can't just be a fan. That's why I can't just hide out in the crowd. That's why I can't just follow him from a distance. I've got to touch the hem of his garment. I've got to grab a hold of his virtue. I've got to cling to the rock of my salvation. I can't be a fan because I've seen the one who walks on water. And that's why I'm convinced that the church owes its members and owes this community, not just good teaching, not just great programs, but an encounter with a holy God. Because I'll tell you what, once you taste and see that he is good, there ain't no going back. I was on the road to Emmaus. I was disillusioned in my faith. I was wanting to go back to fishing. I was looking in all the wrong directions and all of a sudden a man appeared next to me and he began to teach out of the gospels and out of the prophets about the one who would give his life and be resurrected by God's own spirit. And my interaction with that one, it left me with a burning heart and I have never been the same. We are born with a God we barely know. We are born in a faith that we have barely pursued. And when you draw near to Jesus, and when he in fact draws near to you, it marks you in such a way that long distance, fair weather fandom no longer satisfies. I must be his follower. The disciples go from being formed by Christ, watch, to being in the storm with Christ. And this, in fact, is the entire pattern of Christ's earthly ministry. In fact, the longer I follow Jesus, the more I'm convinced that there are essentially two seasons of life for every believer. There are seasons of blessing and there are seasons of testing. I am blessed so I can endure the test that is coming. And I am tested so God can refine the blessing I've already received. I am blessed with a marriage. I am tested with kids. <laughs> I'm just telling the truth this morning, you know it. I am blessed with a job. I am tested with bills. I am blessed with freedom, but I am tested with responsibility. Here's the reality. We are being formed so our faith will not fail when we are being stormed. Let me give you a list of what being in a storm does not mean. Being in a storm does not mean God is mad. Being in a storm does not mean you've messed up. Being in a storm does not mean things won't ever get better. Do you know what being in a storm means? It means you're human. And the best news that there has ever been is the God that you serve specializes at making his presence most felt when life is most difficult. If somebody told me a few weeks ago, pastor, pray for me, I'm really facing a storm. I said, how exciting. It means your blessing is being refined. It means your breakthrough is coming. It means there's a testimony about to come from your life. It means God has more in store for you. It means you're not dead. It means God knows you have the capacity for more. This wasn't the last time the disciples would encounter a storm, but it was the necessary lessons learned on the lake that would forever mark their spiritual development for the days ahead. You've got some lessons on the lake that you gotta learn. Cause what you've been praying for is bigger than you think. It's gonna cost you more than you know. And it's gonna require more than you've got. Watch what the Bible says. It says they was a long way. They was beaten by the waves. 
and they was resisted by the wind. And isn't that what storms do? They separate you from the safety of the shore. They overwhelm you with the size of their waves and they oppose you with the gusts of their wind. Listen, you need commitments in your life before you are tested by its storms. You need commitments in your marriage before it is tried by conflict. You need commitments in your faith before it is tested by hardship. Because if you wait until the storm to figure out your non-negotiable commitments, you will always choose the path of least resistance. Here's the problem. The path of least resistance is also the path of least development. Resistance training is a form of physical activity that is designed to improve muscular fitness by exercising a muscle or a muscle group against external resistance. How is my spirit strengthened? How is my faith developed? When an unstoppable force meets an unmovable object, I didn't give up, I didn't run away, I trusted God in the middle of it, and as a result, he has developed the deep things of my life. I used the external resistance for my benefit. Isn't this what Paul tells the church in Philippians 1? My chains my conflict, my unfair circumstance, my bondage, my abuse, it has been used to advance the gospel. Now you can either choose to waste your pain or use your pain, but the choice is yours. And if I'm gonna be in a storm, at least let that storm advance the gospel and develop my life. Watch verse 26. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they was terrified. They said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus said to them, take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, command me to come, out on to you, come, come to you out on the water. And so Jesus responds, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Now hear me, friend. There is a difference between having a storm and a storm having you. Do you notice that the first thing Jesus does is not calm the storm? It is not to fix the problem. It is not to bail them out. The first thing that Jesus does is tell them to check their heart. The phrase take heart literally means to radiate courage from your interior life. It, Jesus is telling his disciples, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. I've given you courage. I've given you faith. I've given you hope. I've given you grace. Now examine the bank account of your heart and allow what is on the inside to be made manifest on the outside. The second thing Jesus does watch is he rebukes their fear. I want you to know this this morning. Being afraid is a normal human response to an event that happens in a moment of time. But living in fear is different. Living in fear is a spirit that dominates every interaction you have going forward. Paul says this, God has not given us a spirit of fear. He doesn't say God won't allow us to feel afraid. He says the spirit of fear that seeks to dominate the decision-making process of God's people is not from the Father and should not be tolerated by his children. And here's the reality, whether we want to admit it or not, storms don't change you, they reveal you. The storm reveals that many of the disciples are still wrapped up in a crippling amount of ungodly fear. But it also reveals that there is a man named Peter who is audacious enough to ask for the impossible. You know the story. Peter gets out of the boat, he, he walks on water, he begins to sink. Christ lifts him back up. But I need you to see this today. It was safe in the boat. It was dry in the boat. It was 
comfortable in the boat. It was reassuring in the boat. It was non-controversial in the boat. But if Jesus is in the storm, that's the only place that I want to be. I'd rather be with Jesus on the waves than with anyone else who stayed in the boat. We were built for the wild. We were built for the courageous. We were built for the controversial. We were built for awakening. And I refuse to trade the wild waves of revival for the safety of the shore. Can you imagine the dialogue of the other disciples left behind in the boat? Oh, there goes Peter again. Oh, he's sticking his foot in his mouth. Let's see how this one works out. Oh, there's Peter. Audacious Peter. Loudmouth Peter, always asking God for miracles, increase, abundance, the impossible. Why can't Peter just be safe like us? What I've found is that nothing irritates religious people more than someone who is willing to adopt an undignified faith and an undignified worship that pulls on the window of heaven until God pours out a blessing we cannot contain. I refuse to apologize to ask God for the impossible. I refuse to apologize for having an audacious faith. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? I I still believe God can reach a city. I still believe God can transform the Northwest. I still believe God can give us a campus in Kirkland. I still believe, and I'm not asking permission from those who stayed in the boat. This is our time to come alive. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Both the storm and the savior are competing for your worship. You decide which one is worthy of your praise. I love this declaration. Truly, you are the son of God. It reminds me of a quote from C.S. Lewis in his famous book, Mere Christianity. He is quoted as saying this, I, I am trying to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Christ. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man, and said the sort of things that Jesus said. He would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else he is a madman or something else. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him the Lord your God. The decision is yours. And here's how the story ends. I love this. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and they brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. I feel like nothing better encapsulates the difference between being a fan of Christ or a follower of Christ. If we were to be honest, a lot of our spiritual dialogue with God looks like this. Well, if you want to do it, you're just going to have to do it. I'm going to sit where I'm going to sit. I'm going to have the attitude I'm going to have. I ain't going to pray. I'm not going to use my faith. I'm not going to partner with anybody else. But if God really wants me to have it, he'll just give it. And there are times all throughout the Synoptic Gospels 
where Jesus will approach the sick and lay his hands on them and they will be cleansed. But in Matthew 14, the script is flipped and something very interesting transpires. It is not Jesus going to the sick to lay his hands on them. It is the sick pressing through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. And do not the scripture say that if we are to draw near unto him, that he in fact will draw near unto us. I would venture to say this morning that there is a God-given responsibility that you and I have in different seasons of life to not wait for him to come to us, not wait for the pastor to pray for us, not wait for somebody else to ask us how we're doing, but instead despise the shame, endure the cross, press through the crowd and grab a hold of his hem until virtue flows out. Well, I believe God is raising up a bold, audacious faith in this room. Oh, I'm pressing through. I know the opinions of the crowd. I know what they say. I know what they think. I know how they judge, but I'm gonna let God deal with that. It is my responsibility to press through. No, I know I could be in the crowd. No, I know I could receive by proximity. I know I could leave this place and feel a little bit blessed just because of the atmosphere that I'm in, but it is not enough to satiate the great hunger that I feel inside. I am more desperate today than I've ever been. I need him more with every passing hour and ain't nothing going to keep me back from grabbing a hold of the hem of his garments. Now I want you to see this. In many ways, Matthew 14, it is written like a play with three scenes. Scene one, we are formed by God. Scene two, we experience storms on our journey with God. And scene three, we perform in cooperation with God. There was an entire region named Genesaret. It was filled with people who was sick and demonized. And the destiny of a region hinged on the obedience of the disciples. If they would embrace the forming, if they would endure the storming, watch what God would do through the spirits performing. You don't have permission to quit. You don't got permission to give up. You don't have permission to be shallow. You don't have permission to get lost in the crowd or to allow fear to stop your advancement. There's an entire region whose destiny hangs in the balance. And I feel the weight of that reality even as I preach today. Is Genesaret worth it? I would say so. Is Seattle worth it? I would say so. Is Kirkland worth it? I would say so. Is the Northwest worth it? I would say so. Is your family worth it? worth it? I would say so. Is the next generation worth it? I would say so. Are the sick, the demonized, the lost, and the prodigals worth it? I would say so. And if the cost of the miracle that is coming is paid by the faithful endurance of God's saints in the middle of the storm, then I say, bring it on. We've got no quit in us for where we are going is better than where we have been. Come on, would you stand with me as we close? You will be deeply formed by something. I choose God. You will, deep, you will be deeply formed by somebody's words. I choose the living word. Yeah. Maybe the greatest testimony that you'll ever have is the peace that you kept in the middle of the storm. You didn't understand and you didn't deserve. But I've got a God who makes highways in the wilderness. Highways low, low ways high, crooked ways straight. I've got the God who causes living water to come up in the desert. I've got the God who redigs the wells that the Philistines have covered up. I've got the God who never leaves a story halfway done. Let us be formed. Let us endure every storm. And let us step back and watch the Spirit of God 
perform in our midst, not by might, nor by power, but by his spirit alone. Father, now in the mighty name of Jesus, we submit to the transformational nature of your spirit's work. God, today we give you access to every room in the mansion of our heart, every square inch of our lives. We declare in you we live and in you we move and in you we have our being. And God, today we say do the necessary heart surgery in our lives. God, I pray that you would help us by your spirit crucify the crowd mentality and resurrect a discipleship identity. We are here for the long haul. We are here to embrace every hardship as a good soldier. And we will not quit until we see the goodness of our God in the land of the living. So God, today we surrender to your will. We surrender to your way. We say, here am I, God. Here am I, send me. I ain't perfect. I don't have it all together. But God, would you take what I got and use it for your glory. And we'll give you all the praise. And we'll give you all the honor throughout every generation and in the church. In the mighty name of Jesus, all God's people said, Amen.